It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is Salt Shaker. I actually brought one from the house. It's a little dented. This better be returned to the house. I promise I'll get it home, sweetie. Just uh, it's been around a long time, and I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, maybe you know what an anagram is. It's any word or phrase which letters, whose letters, when they are scrambled, create a different word or phrase. I'll give you some examples. Dormitory can also spell dirty room. That one makes a lot of sense. The Morse code, here come dots. A decimal point, I'm a dot in place. Presbyterian, best in prayer. Desperation. A rope ends it. I thought that was fascinating. Election results, lies, let's recount. And then snooze alarms, alas, no more Z's. You can, you can look them up yourself. Those are all accurate. Now, one that's not so good is the word preserve and perverse. And we live in a world where whether we know it or not, and I've thought about using this analogy of the frog that's in the pan of cold water. You put it on the stove, put the frog in there, and you heat it up, and the frog will not jump out. He'll just, he'll just die in the pan. It's actually not true. People use that illustration. Um, but the picture of that, that you just heat it up slowly, 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 and pretty soon you don't even know what happened. What is going on in our world today, it's not that it's never gone on in the world before, because the devil says the same old bag of tricks. He's got no new tricks, no new sins, no new temptations. He's got just different tools and different set of people. But the world has gotten completely jacked up before. We've talked recently about the flood because of the violence that was in the world. God said, do over eight people, all the animals, and let's start all over again. Uh, you have places like Sodom and Gomorrah where it just got completely out of control and literally God sends angels in there to evacuate Lot, his wife, his family, if they would trust God and get out of there and said, do not look back. And in that story, Lot's wife turned around and I like to describe what she had as Sodom eyes. She could not stay forward. She could not point it straight ahead and just say, i got to get out of here. Something about that city and what was going on back there was more important than following God. And so she looked back, and the Scripture says she turned to a pillar of salt. So we're going to talk today about being salt, but not that kind of salt. Um, but if you, if you are a Christian, let's just start there, and I'll address us mostly today. If you are already a Christian... Um, you would think, and I've said this repeatedly through the years, you would think that a kind God, a God that loves us so much that he would be willing to send his own son Jesus to die on a cross, be buried, raised from the dead, do all of this to make heaven possible for us, what kind of twisted, demented God who knows what it's like down here because Jesus has been here, done this, why would he leave us here a millisecond longer than it took for us to believe? Just the second you trust Christ, we should be beamed out of here, get the, get the heck out of this place because heaven is better. Now you have to give some thought to that. If you are still here, and most of the time when Christians believe, unless they're martyred a few minutes later and they won't recant, uh, most Christians become a Christian, and then they're here. They're left here. You have to figure out why it is that God would leave you here and not get you out of here. Now, there's some big words we use in the Christian faith. You, salvation, that's what happens. One of the uh, Salvation from, from eternity separated from God happens when you believe and become a Christian. Then you got a word sanctification, then glorification. The glorification won't happen until you die, until we get to heaven. 
But there's a sanctification process, and that's what we're left here to be a part of. And part, a huge chunk of that, that sanctification process is involved with discipleship. Why are we so huge about discipleship? Because if you just become a Christian, you pull your ticket, you sit on your rear, and you wait till it's over, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to get sucked back into sin and wonder, why am I even here? You can discover why you are here and get on with living that life. And if you don't figure it out, you're going to be tremendously frustrated. You're going to frustrate a bunch of other people. And things, instead of what we are supposed to do is be a preservative, preserve the world, we become part of it becoming perverse because we are not functioning the way we were intended to function. Go to uh, Isaiah chapter 5. I'm not going to read you this whole thing, but there's lots of woes in the Bible. In Isaiah 5, 11, we'll jump in there. And he says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till wine inflames them. So these are hard drinkers. He's warning them, you know, if you're waking up in the morning and you start drinking at breakfast, you got a problem, okay? I don't care what you say, you got a problem. And he's addressing these people. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and flute and wine are in their feasts, but they do not regard the work of the Lord nor consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, Sheol, the place of the dead, has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he who is is jubilant, shall descend into it. People shall be brought down. Each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. Then the lambs shall feed in their pasture, and the waste places of the fat ones strangers shall eat. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as if with a cart rope. They say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. And then verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And it's gotten completely turned around. It is one thing to call evil good. It is another thing to call good evil. And this is what's happening in our world today. There are certain people who say, what you're doing you say is good, we say it's, it's evil. And then you flip it around even more. Those who call evil good, so we say evil now is good, and, and not only that, what you're doing that you claim is good is evil. Now it's bad enough for somebody to say that's doing something evil, and here's where this is going to get wacky. Who are you, who am I, who are we to determine what is evil or not? You don't have to worry about me or you determining it. Look at Scripture. Look at what God says about the world, about our lives. But see, nobody wants Scripture anymore. There is no absolute truth. There's no authority. You can't go to the Scripture and quote Scripture to someone. They say, well, that's your opinion. That's what your book says. Who are you to judge me? Let me tell you something about evil. Evil is evil is evil, period. It doesn't matter what you and I think of it. And you say, well, I think this is okay. If God calls something evil, it is evil. And you can't call something evil good and then go beyond that and say, now what you claim is good, we decide, and it's very fascinating, we can't tell them that their evil is evil, but they can tell us that our good is evil. And where did they get that authority? Because they don't want anything to do with God. They don't want to hear anything about their lives having to change or something being wrong. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus looks at these people following him and says this. You are the salt of the earth. And you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Back then, armies couldn't fight. People, you couldn't preserve food without salt. Salt, they didn't know where all the salt in the world was, so it was a commodity. You, soldiers would get paid in a salt allowance that, where they could literally take salt because it was so valuable. You just couldn't live without salt. And so as a preservative, it was essential. Um, as, a, as, as flavor adding, it's essential. And in, it also creates some thirst. Um, but you're the salt of the earth. What does that mean? 
That means if the world is going to be preserved and not end up perverse, it will be traceable to Christians. And you say, well, how is that possible? That's what he said. So in a community, in, in your business, in your everyday life, when you walk into a situation, you are still alive and have been preserved. Your life has been preserved until you die down here, and he keeps you alive for that long, to be engaged in the population. Churches are not salt warehouses. Churches are places where salt shakers get filled so that when God sees your life, that you, you are the salt of the earth and you get it, then during the week, God reaches down, picks up your life, and says, okay, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I know why I'm here. And he starts dumping salt. And you say, well, Lord, I don't want to go there. He said, that place needs salt. I don't, and, and this is where it gets really screwy for people. They say, well, I lost my job. I get that can be traumatic. And you say, well, and I've been offered a job over here. And I, it's a terrible job, but I really feel like God. I believe that God is telling me to, to go take the job. It's not about the job. It's about the salt. So you say, well, it's going to suck having that job. It's going to suck if you miss the opportunity and just if you would trust him. You think Joseph in the Old Testament wanted to be a slave? No. Do you think he wanted to be running a prison? No. He ended up running all of Egypt. How did that happen? Because he was willing to trust God no matter what, and God used him in Potiphar's house, in that prison, and then saved Egypt and his own family. You say, well, I want control of my life. If you end up controlling your whole life, you may run your life. You're going to run your life into the ground. And then you'll stand before God and you go, wait, this is all I got to show for my life? A little bag, a little sack of gravel from the judgment, from the, the Bema seat? The fire hit my life, I got nothing to show. But I was successful down there. You better be successful up there or you're not successful. Now you say, why do you keep pounding us on this? Because you're just going to stare at the walls till the day you die if you don't put the, the thing, put the clutch in, put it in gear, and let's go. We are the salt of the earth. There are things going on on this planet and have been going on, and our culture, our world, our country, just talk about here, is going down the tubes. And if you look around the country... And if you look beyond our country at the world, places in Europe where there used to be Christians, very few left. And those places are dark places spiritually now. And if you talk to any believer who's gone to try to do mission work in these places, because there is no Christianity, because Jesus is not present in the lives of people in that country, it gets very dark and starts to rot because there is no standard anymore. It took the Romans 500 years, and they were gone. We're going to get it done quicker. We're bigger and better. We are going to self-destruct in no time because we have no standards. We've just black, we've just black markered God right out of the equation. They can take him out of the schools. They can take him out of the government. They can take him out of slogans. Let me tell you where they can't take him out of. They can't take him out of me. And if you're a Christian, they cannot take him out of you. So if you're going to let him live in you and you have no option as a believer, then let him be in you and live through you in such a way that we are what he says we are. You are the salt of the earth. But then he goes on to say, Matthew 5, 13, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? The nature of salt, is it has to have that preservative, that taste, that flavor, or it's not salt. It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You know what you do with bad salt? You throw it out in a, in a snowstorm and an ice storm so people can walk on it. That's not what we're supposed to be. Then he goes on to say, You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This is why we don't change the world. Our salt has lost its, its flavor, its savor. We are not penetrating the culture. We are not going to work and realizing that, yes, we're there to do some job and get a check, but we are there to be a preservative, to have an impact. You say, well, if I take a stand, I'm going to get fired. Get fired. Well, who's going to take care of me? Who do you think has been taking care of you all these years anyway? 
If he could get you that job, he'd get you another job. Well, I'm just, I'm just nervous. You better be nervous because this thing is collapsing. And it's happening all around us like we don't even know what's happening. So he says we're salt. He says we're light. It's interesting. There's an old, this is actually a phrase in our, used to be in our culture. You'd see some old man, some old woman. Man, that guy, he's the salt of the earth. What did that mean? It's defined as a person or group considered as embodying simplicity and moral integrity. A person or group considered the best or most worthy part of society, the salt of the earth. Christians, literally, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Is that how they describe me or you, where we, where we live, where we work, everywhere we go? Or is there just absolutely no difference? 1 Corinthians 5, we'll do a couple more. Okay, so this is an internal thing inside of the church at Corinth, and Paul is addressing it. Now follow this very closely. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, like the lost people aren't even doing what you're doing, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed am absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. People say, do you believe in the security of the believer, that you, once you're saved, you can't be lost? This guy, literally, Paul is saying, he will not repent, he will not change. And by the way, this is a category. Deliver this guy to Satan for the, destru the destruction of the flesh. But what? But he will be saved in the end, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, if you lock up as a Christian so hard on sin that literally it gets to the place where we say, Lord, this person is not going to change, and we were to deliver you to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, meaning, okay, you can have him, and you're going to kill, and you're going to die as a result of that, you would think that would get somebody's attention. But no. Sometimes we lock down so hard, hold on so tight to our sin, <coughs> we refuse to repent, and it literally costs people their lives. So you think God's not serious about sin, and clearly Paul is sin. We don't care about this stuff anymore. If we just went with what's, what's possibly going on in this room today, and we won't repent, and you say, well, what's the big deal, dude? Leave us alone. It's my, it's my life. It's not your life. It's his life. And the problem, if you get neutralized, you say, well, I'm not going to do what God wants me to do, but look, I've even got more verses now I can live like hell and still make heaven. It's that you are not accomplishing what he's left you here to do. You're missing. You're MIA. And then some other troops have got to cover your ground because you refuse to let him live in you and through you and obey him and trust him and, and let your life be his life. Keep reading. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Verse 10, this is astonishing. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. I didn't tell you don't interact with these people in the world, because you, can, you can't do that, but don't do it in church. So you say, well, what are you running off the sexually immoral people and the covetous and extortioners and idolaters? We're encouraging you to change. If you don't change, there's a good chance if we're preaching the gospel, you're going to leave anyway. It's amazing what truth does in a pruning process. I don't have to listen to this. You are so right. Click. But what if you're listening and it's going to help you? 
You go, well, maybe I'll give it another minute. Give it another minute. It might change your life. You might figure out what, why he saved you, what you're here for. And then your life changes as he uses your life to change other people's lives. Verse 11, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, someone says I'm a Christian, who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Don't even eat with them. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? In other words, Paul's saying, it's not my job to judge those people in the world. Why? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. So as we interact with the world, you say, well, I can't go to lunch with that guy. He's cheating on his wife. That's why you're going to lunch with him if he's not a Christian. Well, I just don't want to get involved. It is impossible to be this and not get involved. You're going to get lost in the equation, but that's the point. Holy does not mean you lock yourself in a salt shaker because this is, this is clean salt in here, baby. This is clean. Protected. And then God comes along and says, ah, here we go. Wait. Stop. Look where I'm going to land. But then what happens to our, our country, our culture, our world? People go, wow, things are different around here. You notice since we hired that lady, things are different around here? I've heard about guys going to workplaces, and it's God, it's son of a Jesus, you know, it's everything, everything. And one guy goes in there, and that's not how he talks. And slowly but surely, all that stuff starts going away. Not judging anybody. Just all of a sudden you hear what you're saying. Or they hear what they're saying and what you're not saying. And things start to change. Ah, that's enough. Okay, so here's your homework. You wake up tomorrow or the rest of this day and say, Lord, I'm in. You're in me, I'm in you, and I'm available. I am now logging in as a Christian. And I'm telling you, I'm going to spend some time in the Scriptures. And if I've got sin in my life, you said if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sin, to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So let's start there. Let's get this sin out of the way. And even if I do it again, I'm coming back because I don't want to miss out. And it can't just be I see now that salvation is great. That'll get me into heaven. But I'm still here. There's a reason why I'm still here. You've got to show me what that is. If you have never been discipled, someone come alongside you and walk with you and get you up and running. That is the mission statement of this church. Disciples making disciples. That is what we are about. Because unless you get, you can get born again, but if you don't get raised by somebody where you can function the way he intended as a mature believer, it's not going to go well. And most newborns don't do well alone. So you say, well, I want help. Then ask us for help. We got people in this church that will take you on in a heartbeat and walk with you and help you. You don't have to do this by yourself. And then I'm, I promise you this is what's going to happen. You're going to wake up. You're going to go to work. And he's going to start pouring you out. And you're going to start going, oh, my gosh. I have been missing this all these years. This is crazy and amazing. The conversations, the prayers, the impact. That, you, that, that he starts to have through you just because you got available. Uh, you say, well, how do you know about all these things? If I could take you for a day, and please, please don't, I mean, my wife, my, my children will tell you, I'm not all that. I get that. So I got plenty of, you know, leveling going on there. But if I'm firing on all cylinders, it, it goes better. And, there's, and I got the same Jesus living in me that you got living in you. Now, if you don't have that Jesus living in you, we're about to change that right now. So anybody listening beyond here in this room, you say, I got none of that. I think God has been after me. I feel him close by, but I don't think he's inside. Here's how you get him inside. You say a simple prayer like this. Dear God, 
I know that I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead to pay for my sin and to purchase a place for me in heaven that he offers as a free gift. Right now, I accept the forgiveness of my sins as a free gift. Come live in me, through me, change me. Show me how I am to be salt, light, and change this world. Not just change my world, change this world. Thank you for loving me, for saving me, and that now you're going to begin a process of making me holy and setting me apart to live the life that you intended so that one day I can be with you in heaven, glorified in heaven with you. And I thank you and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you say, well, it can't be that simple. That's how simple it is. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the book says, period, end of story. But that's not the end of the story. That's just the beginning of the new story. And then seeing what God can do living in and through your life. Father, I thank you for your word. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And I thank you that there are still some absolutes in the world. And as screwy as it gets out there, as crazy as it gets, um, that's when the salt works best. Help us get in a place where we are willing to yield to you and stop trying to run our own life and our own destiny, our own future, our own plans, and completely yield as though we were owned by you because we are and let you do what you want to do say what you want to say through us take us where you want us to go all you God and I thank you for the extraordinary way that that works out may get challenging may be different but nothing better than trusting and obeying you for those that prayed just a second ago Lord to become a Christian we thank you we praise you I know there's joy in the presence of the angels of God uh, over one sinner that repents so encourage that person help us know how to be encouragement to them and send them believers help them get in the scriptures and uh, chase after you and grow and learn and for those of us lord who already know you this could be the most exciting day of the rest of our lives because we might finally engage lord as never before in letting you not just live in us but through us there'll be nothing like seeing you there lord or seeing you come in the clouds and uh, help us hope for that more every day. Our prayers even so. Come Lord Jesus. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.